in Proverbs chapter 34, verse 6, it says, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and delivered him out of all of his troubles. In Psalm 34, verse 6, David is talking about a poor man that got delivered out of all his troubles. Now, the poor man had troubles that was connected to being poor. The poor man's troubles was wrapped up in poverty. The only reason why this poor man was crying because the troubles that were created was because he was poor. So these are lack problems. These are problems from not having a lot of money. These are problems for, for not having a lot of things. So the money is not being defended on this man's life. The, it, it's not able to defend him like the Bible says money is a defense. So in this text, when the Bible says the Lord heard him, what does that really mean? That the father started giving him financial strategies. The father opened up the financial information book to his soul. When the Bible said the Lord heard him, that means that the Lord now recruited him to bear the gospel power, to bear the kingdom glory. This means that he opened up the opportunity to be mentored by God on how to be a sower. This poor man was tired of what was birthed out of his mindset, his activities, his decisions, his emotions. He didn't like the pro productivity of it. He didn't like what he was receiving. And he cried out to the Lord for a financial solution, for, for a lack solution, for the mystery of abundance. Now, now look at this, saints. The Bible said that the Lord saved him. Saved him out of all his troubles. Now, look at the word that it used, saved. 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 I'm, I'm saved. Saved. So you saved. Saved. It says that the Lord used salvation to target this man's financial problems, his lack problems, his provisional problems. And salvation dealt with him being poor and making him rich. He saved. So when the Lord saves you, we're not just dealing with the Lord bringing the soul out of doing disobedience, but we seeing that the Lord saving you brings you out of being poor. Now, saints, let me tell you something. All your soul has is thoughts. An evil person will not obey God's thoughts. What makes a person godly and ungodly? 
the thoughts that come from God are rejected by them. That's what makes them ungodly. The thoughts that come from God is received and acted out by them. That's what makes them godly. Saints, an evil person will not obey God. If God tells an evil person something, their pride is on the line. Their arrogance is on the line. So they don't do it. If God speaks to an evil person, it won't be done. If God tells an evil person, go down the street, walk to your neighbor and tell them um, that I apologize for parking in your parking space and not moving when you told me to do it, they won't do it. But if Satan tells an evil person, go down the street and tell that person, don't knock my door again, don't tell me that, they'll go. All that's defining you is the thoughts you yield to and the thoughts you reject. That's all, that's all that defines you. Nobody else defines you, but, but the thoughts that you obey and the thoughts that you ignore. How do you know that you're evil? Because if God gives you a thought, you, sub, you suffocate the thought. You won't move on it. You won't move on the thought. That's what makes you evil. What makes you good is that you move on the thought. So in Galatians chapter five, it talks about the fruit of the spirit. One of it being goodness. Did you know what goodness means? It means that when I receive a thought from God that is on someone else, because how God brings a person into humility, he gives you thoughts about someone else on earth. Did you know that serving God is really yielding to a thought about someone else on earth? <laughs> so so when, when you see somebody say, I serve God and, and oh, OK, so who on earth, who on earth is, is God talking to you about? Who on earth are you leaving your feelings for for that person? Who on earth are you laying down your pride for that person? Who on earth are you letting go of your ego for that person? That's the only way you can serve God. You have never seen God. You have never seen Jehovah. You have never kissed them. You've never hugged them. You only can hug people on earth. And that's why God, before he graduate anybody into eternal life, he was smart. He pitched you down here on earth so that he could try you to see how you deal with him in people form. So saints, if God could speak to you on earth and you could harden your heart down here, God know that you can't go to heaven because... That's, that's, you, that's, that's your response to his thoughts. That's, that's your response to his signals. Saints, everybody in hell, when God speaks to them, they don't move. They don't budge. That's why hell was the only place that was compatible for them. Heaven is a place where the soft-hearted are. They yield to thoughts that God give them. They obey the thoughts that God give them. They do the thoughts that God give them. They speak the thoughts that God give them. Saints, when you have evil in your life, when you have evil in your life, when God speaks to you, your heart in your heart, When you have goodness in your life, when the Holy Spirit is the Lord of your personality, when you hear thoughts of love, you'll obey him. 
Romans 5, 5 says that the love of God has been poured out into your heart by the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit speaks to you, he speaks to you about a person on earth. That's the dialogue of the Holy Ghost. And he tries your heart by giving you thoughts, impressions for a person on earth, a physical person that you have seen. I'm not talking about, oh, Lord, send me a vision of a person. Oh, oh Lord, please, please uh, show me that person that's in Mars right now. No, no, no. It's a person on earth. And all God does is he sends thoughts. And that's how he tries your heart. If you suffocate the thought, you know that you're evil. If you do the thought, you know that you're good. Being born again is simply a thought life from God that you obey. Saints, do you know? There's a portion of your life where Satan speaks to you and you don't struggle to do it. But when God starts talking to you, the thoughts make you unselfish. The thoughts take you out of your pride. It takes you out of your ego. It take you, take you out of your, your, your haughtiness. And when God speaks to you, it makes you a pursuer. Nobody will ever become rich or wealthy in God's kingdom without the voice of the Holy Ghost trying you in your thought life. Because this is the path to become wealthy by humility and fear of the Lord. Our riches, Proverbs 22, 4, is talking about humility and fear of the Lord. And guess where those humility and fear of the Lord, where could it be practiced? In the thought life. So God deals with your thoughts. He sends you thoughts. And the thoughts have instructions. The instructions is to do something for someone else on earth. And that decides your relationship with God. If you ever hear somebody tell you I'm real close with the Lord, ask them this one question. Who on earth? Who on earth? Is he talking to you about and you're obeying him towards them? And that will define everything. <laughs> Isn't that shocking? One question. Don't ask them how much angels they see. Don't ask them how long they pray. Don't ask them how much days they have fasted before. Don't ask them how much they go to church. Ask them, who on earth is the Holy Spirit speaking to you about? And ask them about their obedience to the Holy Ghost, to that person. All God gives you is people on earth. And this is how you become rich. When you obey him towards the person on earth. You have never seen God. You don't know who he is. Nobody, saints, I'm going to tell you right there. Nobody knows God. Nobody. Nobody knows God. All you know is people on earth and God tests you with them first before he brings you to his inner court he tests you with people before he trusts you with his inner he trusts you look look he wants to be close with Moses but he says Moses go to Pharaoh
He, he wants to be close with Abram, but he says, Abram, go, go to Melchizedek. He wants to be close with Joshua, but he said, Joshua, go to Moses. He wants to be close with Esther, but he said, Esther, go to King Ahasuerus. He wants to be close with Daniel, but he tells Daniel, go, 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 go to King Nebuchadnezzar. Go, go to, go to this Babylonian system. He wants to be close with Samuel, but he pits Samuel with Eli. All throughout the word, everybody that God wanted to be close with, he tests your heart with a person. That's all he does. And whether or not you know God or don't know God is predicated on the thoughts you obey towards a person on earth. You want to know how successful a person is with God? Find out their success with a person on earth. If they have no success with a person on earth, they have no success with God. God wants to be close with the woman at Zarephath. So he sends Elijah. Remember what the word says? I've commanded this widow woman to feed you. I've commanded her. But that widow woman never heard nothing according to her. If you would ask her, did you hear something? No, uh -uh, I didn't hear nothing. You didn't hear a voice tell you you're supposed to feed me? No, I didn't hear no voice. But God tells Elijah, I've commanded her. You see the spirit world? God could command you. If you're evil, you'll never identify with the command. If you're humble, you'll hear the command. The command will click with you. If you're evil, you'll never identify with the command. Imagine this woman has a command from God to feed Elijah, and she didn't hear no audible voice. She didn't hear thou, woman, thine you must thine, feed thine prophet when thine seeth him. He's hairy. She didn't hear nothing according to the physical. But this is her assignment. Saints, how God makes you wealthy is he'll pit a person in your life. That's how he makes you wealthy. You say, prophet, well, I have nobody in my life where God not trying to make you wealthy. How God makes you rich is he pits a person in your life. And he does it even if you are filled with the spirit. Since I was filled with the spirit as a teenager. And the Lord pit people over me. While I'm filled with the spirit. Wow. While I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. And, and you know what the Holy Ghost will, will say? Do what they say. Follow that. Obey that. Help them there. Do that. I remember one time I stayed in a mission home. And I remember there was this lady there and uh, in the mission place. I remember uh, she, she was over the mission place. And I remember the Holy Spirit would tell me, help her with this, assist her with this. And I, I, I was the one pursuing her. It was an older lady. I'm talking about like 60, uh, uh, 60, 60 in the 60s. The Lord was telling me to help her. I was the pursuer. She didn't have to pursue me. Because I am Holy Spirit filled. I'm not, I'm not demon possessed. I don't have demons. So I don't have nothing hindering me from the personality of humility. I have nothing stopping me. I have nothing stopping me. I don't have a voice in my head telling me, no, no, don't do that. Uh, 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 wait for her to call you, then you do it. Uh, no, 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 no. If she asks you, then you'll answer. No, 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 stay out her way. You don't want to bother her. 
How could you bother somebody when you're listening to the Spirit of God to help them? How could you bother someone when you're operating in the fruit of kindness? How could you bother someone when you're operating in the, in the fruit of, of, of generosity? How could you bother someone if you're benefiting them with something that they have been praying for? They've been praying for that. That's what they've been longing for. How could you bother them? When I study every pathway of my life, everywhere I went, I was free. I could hear the Holy Spirit speaking to me on how to succeed with a person. Not how to succeed with God. You ain't never seen God. Not to how to succeed with God. You ain't never seen God. How big is God's feet? Do God got a nail polish or not? Well, no, he doesn't. How you know? You have never seen God. And he does that on purpose. He lets you see people. You get promoted. Yeah, he'll let you see him in visions. Yeah, he'll let you see you in, in, in encounters. But if you look at every day on earth, what do you see, people? That's all you see. That's, that's, that's all the Spirit of God does is speak to you through people. He speak to you about people, rather. He speak to you about people. He speak to you about people. He speak to you about people. That's all. Saints, when you are evil, when God speaks to you about a person, you're suffocated. And you'll suffer just not to obey the thought of God. You'll suffer. You'll rather suffer rather than obey God's voice. But when you are God's friend, you'll move on his voice. There's no pride. There's no image. There's no reputation. There's nothing holding you back from following the thoughts of God. The voice of God is a repeated thought that won't go away. The voice of God is a repeated thought that won't go away. The voice of God. That's all, that's, that's all he gives you to connect you to him. Is he gives you thoughts about a person. Because hereby you exercise humility and fear of God. Hereby you loose yourself. Saints, uh, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but that's Tyler Tipton right there that I went to school with. Tyler Tipton, I often tell stories about us as little boys. And the wild thing about it, if my people ever thought that I was lying, here you are today. We, we, we are in March 9th, 2023, and, and we got reconnected supernaturally again. And, and so, so saints, those of you all that hear me talk about Tyler Tipton, that's him on the line. <laughs> you think about it. I, so, so when you hear me tell stories, you might think I'd be lying. You probably be like, oh, prophet is making up stuff. Here, Tyler Tipton right here talking. <laughs> Ain't that crazy? It Tyler Tipton, you hear me tell stories about how I was with and, and, and Tyler Tipton. I don't know if you remember uh, when we had that funny scenario where you was talking about uh, brush the tongue. <laughs> and, and what's crazy is, uh, <laughs> you know, people brush their teeth. Well, when I met Tyler Tipton. <laughs> Tyler Tipton was telling me about uh, uh, how he brushed his tongue. And I remember that was so, that was so, uh, it was memorable to me because, you know, it's, it's just a lot of, it's, it's a lot of things that people have significant knowledges given to them. 
and it's profitable, it's beneficial. And that, that, that was one of the things that it made me laugh with Tyler Tipton. But saints, here's the crazy thing. Here's Tyler Tipton today. And, and he's, he's the same way I described him. <laughs> See, watch this here. Josh could bench press 250 pounds at age 13. See, you, you hear me tell you that I was weightlifting at that age. Here you got a living witness right here. And saying that's that's and Tyler Tipton was strong too, and um, I think we were exercised together. I think we were exercised together. But saying I'm just telling you, it's amazing because the things that I tell you, they are not fairy tales. You know, they're not things that I I, I play in my mind. You know, like there's people that they will they will say things to make themselves feel like something really happened and never happened. You know, like, uh, how, how do people say exaggerate or storytell? These are real life encounters. And, and it's wild, right? You, you hear Tyler Tipton, because I told you, I told you of a story that I had, uh, where one time I had an allergic reaction and the doctors thought that, uh, I had steroids. And uh, the doctor actually apologized afterwards because she, she had assumed because she looked at me and she was like, it's impossible for him to be this age and, and have this level of strength. The saints, I'm telling you, um, I was telling The Nazarites, and I never like really went in depth in teaching on this, but being a Nazarite is what, uh, this is what Sam, uh, Sam, Samson, being a Nazarite, being a Nazarite. I'll probably talk about it in another time. But saints, let's go ahead one more time here. Psalm chapter 34, verse 6 says, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him <laughs> and saved him out of all his troubles. Saints, I have a faithful son that had been sowing into me. Did you know? that he just got a miracle. And, and, and if he permits me to, to say who he is, God, I know that's his business. So if he permits me to say, I'll say who it is. But he received over Been sowing into me, faithful to me, obeying me, doing what I tell him to do, respectful to me. Shutting down any voice that opposes what I say. He been faithful to me. Ninety four thousand. Ninety-four. Just think about that. Whenever you sow, God blesses you immediately on that seed. Let me show you what happens. The minute you sow, the, I, I, I mean not you plan to sow, but the minute that that seed actually leaves you and you make the transaction, whether virtually, whether at a P.O. box, whatever. whenever that seed goes and it's en route, After that seed leaves your hands, God releases the harvest immediately. That's how it works. God don't wait two days and say, you know, let me let this seed simmer in, then I'll release it to them. No, no. As soon as you do, 
God does. Now, saints, I want to say something real mighty to you. When you're sowing, you don't want to get into the earning mindset, but you want to get into the discerning mindset. Because the earning mindset is wearisome. It'll tire you out. When, when, when you get into the earning mindset, you'll get anxiety attacks. I'm showing you something. Discerning doesn't stop the harvest. Discerning gives you a reality of the harvest and that it's already en route to you. And so it creates gratefulness, praise, celebration, because if you know that something is already released towards you, that takes away the stress of worrying about uncertainty on if God saw or, 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 or if God really got more than what you gave and all the thoughts that come that create depression, doubt, death, demonic slavery. So the earning mindset, when you get into the earning mindset, you slowly could slip into the law. And the law makes grace not necessary. Look at what 2 Corinthians chapter 9 says. After you sow, it says God is able to make all grace abound towards you. Look, it didn't say all law. It says all grace abound towards you. So the grace abounding towards you is God saying, I'm going to now supernaturally bring you into my caring heart, my sharing heart my loving and kind heart. And I'm going to let you see the life that I had for you that could not reach you if you dishonored me. Are you seeing this? So saints, I, I want you to look at this and this is why a lot of times people don't know how to rightly define the word because they get confused. Okay, I, I can't earn it, right? Um, dang, dang, dang. So uh, if I can't earn it, then why do I obey? So I got to do this, get him to do this? So here's where people miss it. In grace, God has a faith, a hearing of faith. What does that mean? You'll hear the word of his desires. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He'll tell you what he wants. Now, this is in the realm of grace, not law. It's in the realm of grace. When you do what he says, now you're using the grace. Now, watch this here. So, so now we only dealt with two graces. The grace to hear what he said. The grace to do what he said, but now there's another grace where this grace is to reward you for doing what I said. And that is the harvest grace. So there's a, there's a receiving grace, hearing, hearing and receiving, doing grace, harvest grace. Now watch this here. Somebody may say, well, if it's by grace, I don't have to do nothing. But see, I just told you that there's a doing inside of the realm of grace. Now, if there was no doing inside of the realm of grace, then you won't have to do nothing. And then that grace will still overtake you. You see? But there is a doing inside of the grace. 
So when you're sowing seed, the seed is inside of that grace. When you sow, you're not making God become a provider. You are engaging God as the provider he has always been. So that's why now the provision comes out of him. All of these things are not in law. They are in grace. So let me show you something. If somebody starts sowing in the mentality of law, they reject grace. The grace is his power where miracles happen, multiplication happens. So if somebody starts sowing in law, they actually become tired. They'll become robotic, unexcited. They'll have no dreams. They'll have no expectation. They'll have no praise. They'll have no verbal conversation with God about that seed. Wow. Wow, wow. Did you catch what I said? They'll have no verbal conversation with God about the seed. Like they'll sow that seed. They won't even talk with God. They won't even say, Lord, I'm going to lift up this seed to you. I give this seed unto you right now. I'm sowing this thousand. I'm sowing this 500. I'm sowing this 1500. I'm sowing this 3000. I'm sowing this 200. I'm sowing this. There'll be no conversation with God about the seed being sown. When they're sowing in law, there'll be thoughts of anxiety, anxiousness, uncontrolled thoughts of fear. They'll entertain the possibility of backlash. Oh my gosh, maybe, maybe, maybe this might happen to me. See, that's all sowing in the class realm of law. So when people sow in law, they are actually stop. There'll come a time where they can't sow no more. Lawful sowers have an expiration date. When people sow in grace, the grace keeps on empowering them to new degrees of sowing. And so a person that's sowing in, in the class of grace, because they are in the power of God, the true power of God, they'll never be hindered to sow. Because that grace is God's power guiding them to the next seed, the next assignment, the next instruction, the next sacrifice, the next self-control, the next thing to avoid, the next distraction to resist, the next temptation to deny, the next enemy to not give place to, is constantly giving wisdom, counsel, and empowerment. You see? So when, when a person is sowing in grace, they have nothing suffocating God's thought life in them. When people sow in law, even though they sow, no yokes are destroyed. The seed doesn't set them free from witchcraft. The seed doesn't set them free from lust. The seed doesn't set them free from disloyalty. When they sow in law, the seed doesn't take away their wandering eyes, their scattered thinking. A person that's so in, in the classroom of law will still betray, will, will still betray, will still hate, will still gossip, will still fear, will still worry, will still lust, will still fornicate, will still miss God. When people sow in grace, they're immersed 
in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes upon them. And so the seed that they sow is strengthening their allegiance and alliance with them in the Holy Ghost. And their oneness, their relationship, their fellowship starts to go to different degrees of intimacy. So saints, I, I, I want you to see this. So if you look at the life of Solomon, when he's sowing in the classroom of grace, look at what his priority is. I don't want to sin against you. I don't want to fail the assignment you gave me. I don't want to make any decisions you don't like. I don't want to mistreat any person that you pit underneath my care. I don't want to fail kingship. I don't want to see you grieved. I only want to make the moves that make you happy. Look at the mentality of Solomon as a sower of grace. You say, prophet, well, show me a sower of law so I can understand this. Well, look at Cain was a sower of the law. He was only sowing because he knew it was supposed to be sown. That's all. It, 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 he was not attached to it. He was not entangled with sowing. He just knew I'm supposed to sow. So let me, I, I, I pit something on the table. I'm supposed to sow. So I, I just pit. Look at Cain's mentality while he's sowing in law. Jealousy, envy, anger, competition, covetousness. Look, look, look. Disrespect to the Lord. Murder, hatred, disliking, selfishness, sadness, pity party, resentment, offense. Now, saints, if, if you understand the story correctly, Cain did so. It's not that he didn't so, but he was a sow of the law. So his heart wasn't in the sowing. His hand sowed, not his heart. His heart was upset. His heart was disconnected from God. His heart was hard. His heart was fearful. His heart was jealous. His heart was worried. His heart was hateful. The inward part of Cain had no entanglement with what he was doing. He still lived a sinful life. He still did what, it, what he wanted in his personal schedule. He still followed his own path. He still did his own will. He still had his own desires completed. He still was his own God. He still was his own decision maker. There was no submission to God. So saints, what I'm teaching you is very apostolic here. I'm setting you free. I'm showing you that you have to become of grace so that the changing could happen, the transformation could come to you through the power of the Spirit of God. I was telling you about my son. He was sowing. He'd been faithful to me, obedient to me, listened to what I told him to do, been respectful to me. If somebody came to him, he wouldn't speak to them because he didn't want to disrespect the favor I had given to him. He respected the protocol. He received a miracle of over $94,000. The Bible says in Proverbs 28, verse 20, the faithful man shall abound with blessings. The faithful man shall abound with blessings. The faithful man shall abound with blessings. If you keep yourself consistent in your humility and fear of the Lord, you'll have blessings that prove to you you are doing the will.
The faithful man shall abound with blessings. That means that the blessings will become bigger around you. You'll see them. You'll taste them. You'll feel them. You'll wake up to them. You'll go to sleep with them. You'll experience them when you are eating. You'll experience them when you're drinking. You'll experience them when you put on your clothes. You'll experience them when you put on your shoes. You'll experience them when you're driving your car. You'll experience them when you close your eyes. When you wake up, it constantly abound. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Saints, that's why, that's why I'm teaching you. Don't subdue the thoughts that God gives you. Only when you love God can you break the curse of hardening your heart when God speaks to you. Never fight with God. Saints, when you are in a humble place, you'll recognize how much the Lord been doing for you throughout the course of your life, even when you wasn't obedient to him. You'll recognize how much the Lord been doing all throughout your life. The Lord been doing stuff for you, even when you didn't recognize it. And so, saints, when you get to this place in life, you should want to pay God back. Pay him back, not by finding out random stuff that he doesn't require of you, but just meeting the simplicity of the requirement. To whom much is given, much is required. To whom much is given, much is required. You know, there's many people that receive much and they don't, they don't be faithful to God. They don't love him. There's many people on earth, there's millions of people that have much from God that they will not give any respect to him. You should have a burning zeal inside of you to break that cycle and say, Father, you're going to look at me and say, I'm glad. I'm glad. That I poured into him, I poured into her, because you'll give God back his due honor and respect and obedience. You'll give him back your body, you'll give him back your mind, you'll give him back your time, you'll give him back your praise. And saints, that's what the Lord, that's all he needs is faithfulness. The faithful man shall abound with blessings. The faithful man shall abound with blessings. The faithful man shall abound with blessings. You know, when you're faithful before God, you don't lose no confidence. When you're faithful with God, you could be bold. You could be, you could be courageous. But when you sin against God, you lose your confidence. You lose your boldness. You lose your consistency. But when you choose faithfulness, you walk in the blessing. You walk in the spirit of the Lord's voice. And you follow the thoughts that God give you. You don't suffocate his thoughts. You don't shut down your bowels of compassion when God talks to you. You'll do what he says. Saints, this is how you become wealthy. You have to become fed up with being wicked. That's how you become wealthy. You have to hate your feelings that hinder God. This is how you become wealthy. You become wealthy when you hate the feelings that make you prayerless. You have to hate the feelings that make you stubborn, disinterested in the Lord. That makes you not study the word. Saints, I study the word of God all the time. 
It doesn't matter what I'm doing. I'm going to find a way to study the word. I'm going to find a way to memorize some scriptures. I memorize scriptures that I don't even preach to you because I study the word for me. You got to be selfish about your spiritual food. Hallelujah. And when you're selfish about your spiritual food, you won't violate where God wants to feed you. You won't say, okay, I'm selfish about my spiritual food, so I'm going to go eat anywhere. No. When you're selfish about your spiritual food, you're only at the restaurant where the favor of God has ticketed the meal. You're not eating just because food is being served. Oh, you know, they, they serve a son in Chicago. You, you know, they just opened up a new restaurant in Florida. You know, they, they just released a new restaurant in Los Angeles. You know, you know they're making some new food in, in Minnesota. You know, oh, hey, man, they, hey, they just pitched something out in Philadelphia. You, hey, man, they just, you know, you, man, you got flat in Toronto. They about to release some new, 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 new food there. No, you only eat where the favor of God has ticketed the meal. When you're selfish about your spiritual food, even if somebody offer you food, you'll say, no, thank you. Uh, I'm already on a diet right now. And, and if you look at the word diet, if you take the T out of the word diet, you get the word die. See, people die. Because they think that they're eating spiritual food, but it's no longer spirit if the spirit didn't lead you there. Even though the food could be spiritual, but for you, it's no longer spirit because the spirit didn't lead you there. Now you know why the man can go catch the Ark of the Covenant and die. What's wrong with you protecting the Ark of the Covenant? That wasn't assigned to you. That wasn't your diet. So now you have to die because you tried to eat an activity that wasn't prescribed to you. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. When you're going down the path of destruction, there's no submission. The path of destruction, there's no one pathway. When the path of instruction, there's no absolutes. The, the path of destruction, there's no firm strictness. There, there's no boundaries. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. But, but narrow, straight and narrow is the way that leads to life. And what did the Bible say? Only a few there be that finds it. Only a few. It's only a small amount of people that find the way that leads to life. There's only a small amount of people that finds the way that leads to life. It's a privilege if you find the way that leads to life. And since the blessing about the straight and narrow way is that riches is here, wealth is here. Saints, I'm going to tell you like this here. Riches and wealth shall be in your house because you fear the Lord. Psalm 112 was talking about that rich man, but David said that he feareth the Lord. He respects God. He's unwilling to do anything that offends God. He's unwilling to let his mind dwell anywhere. And, and you know, because he fears God, when God gives him a thought, he acts on the thought. He doesn't think 20 minutes and say, no, I'm not going to be the one to do it. No, I'm not going to say, no, I'm not, I'm not going to pick up that can on the floor. They pick that can on the floor. And the spirit of God say, pick the cart back. I'm not going to pick the cart back. I didn't even pick the cart right here. When you fear the Lord, all of those thoughts have no power over you. When you fear the Lord, you're the one. That is ruling your spirit. You're ruling your attitude. You're ruling your meditation. You're ruling your imagination. When you are led by the spirit, you are the peacemaker. You are the peacemaker. 
That's why Jesus taught, blessed are the peacemakers. So people that can't make peace are cursed. That's why they can't make peace. They can't lay down their ego because they're cursed. When you're blessed, you can make peace. When you're blessed, you can make solutions. When you're blessed, you can be the lover in every environment. When you're blessed, you could be the one that's removing the tension, removing the, the strife, removing the lust, removing the fear, removing the worry, because you're blessed. When you're blessed, but when you're cursed, it's not about God, it's about you. And it's about, I don't feel like I should do that. I don't feel like I should pick up that piece of paper. I didn't put it there. You see, saints? I don't think that I should have to help that person carry those bags. I didn't buy those groceries. I don't think that I should have to leave the door. I shouldn't stand right here and open the door for them. I don't even know who they are. And these are the thoughts that people have within themselves. And it's all evil. It's all evil. And the more, the more, the more you follow those thoughts, the more you corrupt yourself, the more you miss God's schedule, the more you miss your destiny, the more demons you invite to rule your life. Demons love stubbornness. Demons love when you resist God's thoughts. Demons build an altar around the person when you no longer yield yourself to the spirit of God's ideas. When you don't budge, when you don't follow God's nudge, demonic families are created in your environment. Demonic families are created in your environment. The power of this life in Jesus is all about saying a good reaction to the thoughts that he put inside of you. This is where all your freedom and liberty and all your money is. All your health and blessings and all of your joy, all of your strength and all of your holiness and purity and cleanliness all of your righteousness, all of your rewards, all of your anointing is in you following the thoughts that God gives to your heart about a person. This is where the blessing is. This is where the blessing is. This is where the favor of God is. This is where God's glory is. This is where your healing in your body is. This is where all your provision is. You like nice things? It's divine when you like nice things. God created you to like nice things. All the nice things you're supposed to have is in obeying a thought towards a person. I told you that he that loves first is the wisest person in every room. You follow the person that loves first. They are the example. They are the one that's free from the devil. They are the one that have no curses. You want to meet a person with no yokes? Follow a person that loves easily. Loves without any resistance. Loves without any backlash. Loves without any regret. Loves without any stubbornness. Loves without any worry. Loves without any competition. Loves without any jealousy. Loves without any distraction. Loves without any backsliding. Loves without any unfaithfulness. You want to find the wisest person in any city any environment, any workplace, any ministry, any family, any location, any household is the person that follows the idea of God without wrestling and pitting their input and pitting their opinion and pitting their own spin to it and pitting their own offenses into it. Well, well, I don't think I should have to say that because, you know, I don't I, I don't think I should have to say that. Well, I'm younger. So 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 and since I'm younger, they're older. They're supposed to say, you know, because I'm black and, and they're white, 
You know, I don't think that I should say that because they're white. After all, it was white people. You, you, you know, you know, because 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 I, I I'm a woman and that's a man. No, I don't think that. Nah, be, be, no, be, because 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 I'm a man. And, and, and he's a man. He he shouldn't have. I shouldn't have to say nothing to him. He's a man too. He could tell me something. He he could speak up. And, and, and we're both men. So so I, I I'm gonna let him do. No no because that's my father and I'm his son. I I shouldn't have to say that. He's the father. No, no that's because that's my mother and I'm the daughter. No no she should say something to me. I ain't gotta say nothing to her. She should say something to me. And saints evil. Is so prevalent. Everybody is struggling with a disease not called coronavirus. It's not AIDS. It's not an STD. It's not having syphilis. It, it, it's not herpes. The greatest disease on earth is evil. It's, it's the thoughts that God gives that get combated inside of us. You don't want to move on the thought. I'm not doing No, I ain't going to do it. No, I ain't never. And time goes by, you never do it. Meanwhile, this is where all your money is. Meanwhile, this is where all your freedom from demons is. If you just obey the thoughts that God give you. Why haven't you changed as a person? Because you won't. Obey the thoughts that God gives you. That's why the Bible can't change you. That's why the blood of Jesus can't change you. That's why the power of the Holy Ghost can't change you. Because you're resisting where he pits his power. You're resisting where he pits his blood. You're resisting where he pits his angels. Where he pits his kingdom. You know where he pits it? All of his miracles. You know where he pits it? You know where he cleanses your blood? You know where he cleanses your soul? He pits it in a thought. The woman with the issue of blood, her deliverance is not in Jesus' body. It's in Jesus' transference system of thought. It's in the telepathic thoughts of Jesus. If she says, I'm not going out there because these people don't know that it's against the law for me to step out and I got a blood disease, I got a blood problem, I could get stoned, I could get laughed at, somebody might snitch on me, somebody might say, before I get to Jesus, weren't you the woman with the issue of blood? Somebody might laugh at me, or they might push me away. Jesus might not want nothing to do with me. All these different thoughts was not inside of this woman. She said, if I just touch, if I just contact him, if I just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. I'm not worried about mama. I'm not worried about daddy. I'm not worried about children. I'm not worried about presidents, prime ministers, legislators, mayors. I'm not worried about the city councilman. I'm not worried about Lil Boosie. I'm not worried about no rapper, no musician, no artist, no actor, no actress. I'm not worried about no 100 bill board. I ain't worried about no city, no state, no country, no nation. I'm not worried about no facility, no organization. If I touch him, it's about me. I'm the one that want to be free from evil. I'm the one that want to do good. I'm the one that want to be blessed. I'm the one that want to be rich. I'm the one that want all the money that God got for me. I'm the one that want to be healed supernaturally. I'm the one that want God to bring people to my life, to bless me and do good to me. I don't want no evil backlash. I don't want to suffer evil two times. I don't want no diseases. I don't want to die prematurely. I don't want to get robbed. I don't want no death ruling over me. This ain't got nothing to do with nobody else but me. I'm going to follow the thought that he placed inside of me that is carrying all that I'm supposed to experience. If I, if I touch, it was all telepathic thoughts. The woman got healed because she humbled herself to the thought 
that was given to her about a person on earth. And guess what his name was? Jesus, Yeshua. You want to call her Yeshua Hamashiach? <laughs> the other day I was ministering to a man and the sun was outside, true story. And I told the man some things and he was like, well, you, you, you're correct, you're accurate and stuff like that, but that doesn't mean that you're hearing from God. And the man said this out of nowhere and it was the spirit of God had him say it. The spirit of God pit in his mind. It's so funny. He said this to me out of nowhere, just random. He said, if you could look at the sun directly without becoming blind, I'll bow down to Jesus. I said, I was, I was waiting for you to ask. Come on, let's look. I said, come on, come on, let's. I said, come in, come stand right here. Come on, let me let me look in the sun and show you. Meanwhile, he don't know I done did this for many people. I done looked in the sun all the time. I never got blind. Does people look in the sun and get blind? Yes. But Prophet Joshua Holmes looks in the sun because I showed him. I said, look, 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 look. We're looking at the sun, correct? And he was like, no, 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 I can't look. I can't look. I said, well, how you going to see that I'm looking if you're not looking? And the man cringed like this here, grown man, grown man. And when I looked at him cringing, it was more than the sun. He was cringing at the presence of the spirit of God. It... He saw it. The sun been out for years. The sun was out before I did that. Why all of a sudden now he balled up? I shook his hand. I said, now, now do you believe? Pray. That man received Jesus. Do that all the time, by the way. Do that all the time, by the way. All the time. Do that all the time. Thoughts. What do you speak? You're just speaking your thoughts. What do you do? You're just doing your thoughts. That's why, saints, don't let nobody deceive you. People have told people for ages, even though you do that, you're not what you do. Then who in the whole hell am I? If I'm not what I do. So if you look at a man molest children and he's not a pedophile. And he keeps on molesting children and he's not a pedophile. You watch a man kill 20 people. Then they let him off at jail, put him on parole, put him on probation, and he kills 10 more people. And his lawyer, stand, his lawyer stands up and says, you know, this man is not what he does. These 30 plus people that you have seen him kill, he's not what he does. Well, how come my mind never went there to kill 30 people like him? He done killed, he done chopped. How come my mind didn't go there? Huh? What was going on with his antennas for him to get there? Saints, you are what you do. You are what you say. The thought that you obey becomes you. The thought that you obey becomes you. The thought that you do becomes you.
The thought that you do becomes you. Saints, when a thought is in you, you can resist it. You can cast it down. The Bible says casting down vain imaginations. Casting down. Casting down. How many thoughts do you cast down? Well, well, I don't cast them down. I'm working on it. Imagine that. You don't cast down because you, you won't cast down what you are. But the minute that is no longer you, you'll cast it down. Because you'll say, this is not me. I am obedient. This is not me. I am pure. This is not me. I am saved. I'm born again. This is not me. I honor God. I don't rob him with my money. I sow my best seed. I release my faith and he releases his finances to my life. When I release my faith, he releases his finances. He releases his freedom. He releases his fire. He releases his favor. When it's no longer you, you're cast down. You're cast it down. 